Uh, in terms of our process, so um, we'll just walk you sort of through this at a high level uh, in terms of what we do. Uh, so we have a three-phase digital uh, design strategy approach. Uh, so the first phase of that approach is an identification phase. So this is where we're um, often doing our research and a lot of our initial uh, future state visioning uh, when we're looking at a product. Um, for us, because we kind of have a technical background, um, you know, this will often move from uh, user research into more robust business analysis when needed. Um, but we also are you know, very motivated to look at the broader customer journey when we're working with clients. So we do a lot of journeying and experience mapping uh, as part of this phase. Um, so from there, we move on to a conceptualization phase. Um, so above and beyond just wireframing and mock-ups, um, this is where we actually want to establish a, a blueprint for what we're building. Um, so this might mean technical documentation for what we're building, uh, information architecture, user interface designs, prototypes, uh, the works, everything we need to make sure that we have a, a vision that's established for our product. Uh, and from there, uh, validation is really critical to everything we do. Um, so we believe that uh, when we're uh, delivering a product, we need to test it uh, both with our users, our end users, um, also with anyone involved in using it. So you're all familiar with working with Drupal. Um, you know, the content management side is often neglected. Um, user acceptance testing with our, our um, product owners is really critical to our process. Um, and then in the long term, we also think that uh, qualitative uh, research is a really critical component to um, assessing what you've done when you've built something. Um, so on the technology side, uh, so we predominantly work with technologies of the web. Um, so uh, our teams are uh, agile. Um, we, our teams are scalable. Uh, we have a combination of front end, back end, project management, QA. Um, and um, we think this approach is really strong because we think iteration is really important to delivering really good customer experiences. Uh, on the technology side, uh, we're at a Drupal conference. Um, you know, we, we believe in uh, open source technology as much as possible, uh, but we also uh, believe in integration. And we think that the competitive benefit of open source technology is that it can integrate with um, other open source technologies, but also with proprietary systems. Um, so integration is a core of what we do. Um, content management is also core of what we do. Um, and um, you know, as we're looking, um, you know, if you kind of follow Dries, um, you know, this idea of build elsewhere, uh, that's definitely a mandate for us. So we also, um, you know, wherever possible, lean in technologies like JavaScript to build the right experiences. Uh, and then just another part of our uh, core offering. Uh, so we also have a long-term uh, customer success program. Um, so we call this Therefore Care. Uh, so, um, you know, it, to put this simple, it's post-launch support, um, but uh, in the long term, what we're moving towards more is um, UX research and strategy as a part of that. So this idea of continuous product improvement over time. Um, so just to introduce us. Uh, so our team, so we have UX designers, uh, technical architects. Um, you can, uh, we have a, another uh, uh, talker talker, speaker, <laughs> tomorrow, uh, Justine, who's in the crowd here, so she'll be doing a talk on uh, what exactly technical architect means to our team at Therefore, if you're interested. Um, and then we also have um, you know, our specialized developers, front end, back end, full stack. Um, and our team is always growing, so if you're in the market for uh, career change, uh, look us up. So my name is Sean Rio, so I'm a director of strategy at Therefore. Uh, so I mean, in terms of what I do, um, a lot of stuff at the operational level, but uh, I also work with our clients on UX research, strategy, and business analysis. Uh, I've been with Therefore for six years, um, like also spoke at many different Drupal events such as this, and worked with Drupal for most, basically my entire career. Um, hi, I'm Clement. Um, I'm a technical architect at uh, Therefore. And I'm mostly doing the back end here, and it's been five years, I guess. <laughs> awesome. All right, so uh, we'll get to the, the meat and potatoes here. So uh, what we wanted to walk you guys through today was a case study for one of our recent projects. Um, so uh, the, um, the sort of the, some of the background here, uh, so we were engaged to work with Imagine Canada, which is a nonprofit here in Canada, um, to uh, redevelop a core product of theirs, Grant Connect. So just to give you the deeper background here, so Imagine Canada, um, they have a number of mission critical programs that serve Canadian charities. Um, you know, part of these uh, are, you know, basically we have a, a model where a social enterprise um, supports a, a broader sectoral mandate um, for growth and advocacy in the sector. Um, so one of those uh, social enterprises is Grant Connect. Um, so uh, in the sort of history of Grant Connect, this started off as a print guide, 50 years old. 
um, which would list all of the different uh, organizations in Canada that support um, charities through grant programs. Um, but that's evolved over time into different iterations of a digital product. So they've had these online versions, online database versions um, throughout that history. Um, and uh, you know, as a tool to charities, it's instrumental uh, to, to finding funding and, and operating in Canada. Um, but more than that, it also allows uh, Magic Canada to support that mandate um, because it's effectively a product with a fairly expensive subscription service. Um, so in terms of the project, uh, so Grant Connect's gone through many iteration cycles uh, throughout its history. So it's been redeveloped over and over again. Obviously, I'm sure everyone in the room has experienced this um, with, with other projects or clients that you've worked with. Um, they have this cycle of replacement um, instead of iteration. So every single, you know, every five years, they throw away what they had, you know, keeping their data, and they rebuild um, from scratch, uh, which obviously comes with a bunch of associated costs. Um, so coming to us, um, they were looking to change this model. Uh, they wanted to move to a more iterative model to, um, to developing and improving their product. Um, some of the reasons behind this, uh, so there are new competitors in the marketplace for them. Um, there's also American incumbents uh, that are you know, potentially moving into the Canadian market. Um, so they kind of need to establish themselves. Um, they do have a fairly uh, unique value proposition in their, in their, their research and background. Um, but you know, the, the risk of uh, new competition is the same in any industry uh, where a company can come in with UX and uh, you know, totally disrupt the marketplace. Um, so that was a big uh, you know, impetus to them to move to a more iterative model and be able to start actioning the customer feedback they've been getting. So um, like I'm saying here, uh, to really be able to move this forward and continue to support that um, social enterprise mandate, uh, they needed to change their approach. Uh, so, um, just to kind of dig deeper into some of the technical challenges or, or even project um, constraints, um, you know, we basically what we're trying to do here is take this product that has a long-lasting history and future-proof it. Uh, so if we look at some of the specifics, so we have uh, a massive amount of uh, legacy data. So we have uh, over 100,000 different funder records um, with organizations uh, from across Canada. Um, we have a gift history actually sourced from um, the CRA. Um, so we actually have uh, decades of data and, and millions of individual records. Basically, this represents every single um, disclosed uh, funding for uh, nonprofits in Canada. So um, and a lot of organizations are giving away you know, hundreds of these per year. So it adds up. Um, we also have uh, complex content structures, so um, you know, each of these funders represents uh, dozens of individual data points and a complex taxonomy structure uh, to organize it all. Um, and then we are also looking at all of this data being stored in an old MSQL database that nobody knew why or how or any of these things, so we needed to figure that out as well. Uh, so in terms of some of the project constraints, so coming in, uh, Magic Canada had a budget. Uh, for what they wanted to do with the project. And it was you know, a fairly firm um, uh, project budget, which meant we needed to kind of work back from this um, you know, sort of sprint allocation. Um, and so six agile sprints was our goal. Um, we had a long list of legacy features. Um, you know, the application had kind of gotten bloated over the years, so we needed to deal with the you know, um, change management on that side. Um, and then the, uh, you know, as Grant Connect's competitive advantage really is in its robust uh, data and also this legacy customer data going back years, um, they really needed to make sure that that got carried into a new system, uh, even if the system was going to change. And, oh, sorry. Uh, so in terms of the customer needs, so uh, very challenging in this case as well. Uh, so, you know, different than um, just your, you know, run-of-the-mill website. Um, this is actually a tool that people are using to... Uh, to perform their work, and it's highly technical work. So, um, it was uh, you know we, we had to understand that grants seeking process. Um, we also have uh, a lot of different needs that it serves because Canadian charities can be really diverse and support a lot of different causes and populations. Um, you know, in a lot of that, you know, there's some sensitivity around um, specific population groups in Canada as well. And uh, then the yeah the, that process itself, uh, the mechanics of it, of course, are very critical to uh, to how the whole application comes together. So, uh, in terms of our approach, uh, so, uh, you know, effectively, what the, one of the pretenses of the pro this project was to move to a more iterative model for what we're going to do, um, and we're also working within this budget constraint. So, um, to be able to, you know, provide a scalable solution, uh, it was our recommendation to start with an MVP approach. Um, so, basically, what we, the goal here was to ensure 
um, that minimum viable product uh, to sort of set the baseline and um, to be able to build on that over time in an iterative way by keeping things simple, uh, keeping user experience simple, and be able to action customer feedback through metric analysis and, um, and user research so that the project can improve over time. So again, just to give you uh, some key points here on how this project works, so we did about a month of intensive UX design. Um, we uh, worked with React on the front end, um, and both on the design and development side, we worked inside of the parameters of material design. Uh, we worked with uh, the content of Drupal 8 decoupled CMS, uh, which we'll get into later. And um, the project was basically three months, um, although we've added additional sprints since because we're already starting to action user feedback. So uh, to kick things off, um, we engage our, our strategy process. Um, so the first part of this process, as I mentioned before, um, this identification process. Uh, so in this project, um, obviously, we're dealing with subject matter experts, and um, we also had some uh, you know, very involved product owners. Um, so these stakeholders uh, really were coming to the table with that desire to iterate the platform forward, or, uh, forward and build in their internal capacity to do that kind of um, research and improvement. Uh, so while you know, most projects, even if people like say they just want to rebuild something, there's always new features, new things they want to do, um, but for them the user experience was really the primary goal to improve that. Um, and in fact, a measurable goal that they wanted to attain. Uh, we also had a really good buy-in from our product owners, a young team um, at a legacy organization. So um, they uh, came with a lot of uh, buy-in to this, to having a novel approach. Um, you know, this obviously, won't, you can't suggest an MVP in every scenario, but they bought in. Um, and then the team that we're working with was also, they come from the industry, they're subject matter experts, and without them, we wouldn't have been able to dissect all the vernacular and terminology, because uh, going into this, I knew nothing about fundraising. Um, so speaking to that, uh, the initial process of this was kind of a crash course in fundraising for us. Um, I mean, if anyone who's familiar with uh, sales process or marketing process gets the model of the funnel, um, so there's very much a specific fundraising funnel, um, and this model informed a lot of what would become the user experience for this application. Um, so uh, they, we were lucky enough to have access to uh, a lot of additional um, or uh, initial research that they had done in the background. So um, they had done a series of most, uh, most flows and um, also obviously Google Analytics. Um, so reviewing that, we, while we were looking at that from the, through the lens of trying to validate um, you know, what we would build, it was also very useful for us in terms of prioritizing our MVP um, because we basically had data to back up what users just weren't touching and what users really needed. So this data was crucial to us in um, you know, negotiating the specific scope of the MVP, um, but also in prioritizing the user experience around actual core activities that people do. Um, so, uh, heuristic evaluation, I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with the term, but um, essentially uh, what we do here um, is we take a set of uh, established usability heuristics or basically models um, and we use that to assess an application based on, um, you know, kind of these established things. So, you can think of like accessibility um, as, you know, being kind of a broad usability heuristic. Um, so, for, the, for us, this kind of serves two purposes. It gives us um, the ability to look at the current experience to empathize with the existing user base um, and to identify some of the pain points they might be facing at the moment, some of the complexities that we're going to face from a user interface standpoint. Uh, but it also gives us, you know, this opportunity to just look at every friggin' tiny little detail of the site uh, and inventory it to really understand what it is. Um, we then did some landscape analysis. So uh, this is sort of competitive, uh, similar to competitive analysis, but because we were looking at an application that uh, in a lot of ways shared features with things like sales, uh, like CRM tools, um, and other uh, you know, things like faceted search tools, um, we wanted to look not just at the competitors in the landscape, but also contemporary analogous experiences. So um, you know, looking at things like uh, PipeDrive, which we use internally as our sales tool, um, looking at things like Kijiji, which just so happened to have kind of a similar facet-driven model, um, and then again, looking at competitors in the space. Um, so another key component for us in terms of uh, getting that buy-in and establishing the scope of the project was um, value proposition thinking. Um, again, because we're kind of reapproaching this old product with a new team and an MVP approach, um, we could kind of lean on some of these startup methodologies like 
uh, value proposition canvas to really get to the bottom of what the core features should be um, in comparison to the tasks or jobs that a uh, customer is responsible for. So if you haven't done this before, I highly recommend it for any product oriented project. Um, you know, effectively what we try to do is establish on the left hand side the features of the product. Um, on the right hand side, we establish the jobs that users are responsible for, and then we try to find an alignment between the two. Um, so the way we try to find that alignment is by identifying um, you know, possible gains that they might experience in using the product and identifying how those features respond to those gains. Um, similarly, we want to use that product to relieve existing pain points in their workflow, um, and we can identify things within the product that actually do relieve pain. So it's a great mental model exercise, and um, you know, I think it's effective and powerful for uh, prioritization, because if a customer says, what about that feature that's supposed to be super awesome, we can say, well, it's just not part of their core tasks. Um, so from that phase, uh, the initial identification phase, obviously there was other things involved there, but I think some, those were some of the most valuable things in terms of the MVP. Um, moving on to our conceptualization design phase. Um, so this is a little washed out, I uh, apologize for that, but um, you know, because we're dealing with uh, really, really robust um, data, there was a, a strong need to ensure that information was prioritized. Um, so uh, working with our subject matter experts, um, we started to build uh, a visual system around groupings of information, um, basically starting to set some buckets. Um, and then we worked with our, those subject matter experts to really to drop in all these specific data points um, in groupings um, so that we could start to build that UI up um, around prioritization of information. Um, so uh, I, I, this is the kind of exercise that can be done really nicely um, with uh, sticky notes, but um, we were actually workshopping this directly in Lucidchart uh, with the client. Um, so I mentioned before material design, um, so I mean with any project where you have an MVP or a prototype approach, you don't always have the opportunity to get really deep into visual design. I mean we certainly, I think we put um, like a decent amount of polish on the designs for this project, but um, we didn't want that to be a bunch of additional technical debt for the developers to make up. Um, so uh, we tried to stick as strongly to a material design um, principle as we could and use the material design spec to establish, to ensure that um, any interaction that we introduced in the application was sort of built around a standard. Um, so the additional benefit for this, uh, of this for us was that moving into development, the developers were able to adopt uh, Material UI, which is um, a React-based uh, framework, and um, immediately start actioning some of the things that we'd uh, mapped out in the designs, because it was all just out of Material Design. Um, now, of course, just as uh, you know, we want to make this thing look good <laughs> is, like, is a priority. So we certainly put a lot of effort into that. But um, I think from one of the key things here was to just uh, achieve that balance between material design, something that's highly functional, and also the fact that this needed to be a product. Um, so uh, you know, Grand Connect fits into this ecosystem as a sub brand, um, and you know, it does have its own identity. And this is an identity that, over the course of our engagements with uh, Imagine Canada we're going to be responsible for helping them to market. So um, we did want the application to have its own look and feel, um, and so um, certain attention was provided for that as well. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to now move into just walking you through the experience that we came out from um, after looking at all this. Um, I'll try to walk you through a bit of the thinking and how we arrived at it. Uh, but uh, basically, once we distilled down all of our research, um, we basically established a, th a three screen based application, so three different um, you know, possible interfaces um, with a search based navigation. Um, and I think if there's any sort of like a, a broad takeaway for this is look at the, you know, it's a, there's a lot of information on the screen, but it's three experiences. And I mean, it's very rare that we get to design something or build something, especially in the Drupal space, where we only really have three templates. So, um, so I think it's a, it's a powerful model and it's, uh, there's looking at things through that lens of simplicity I think worked really well here. Um, so to start this off, uh, so this, the experience is very much built around a um, global search. Um, so this global search uh, has you know, three separate facets or areas that people can go in from. Um, the existing application had an autocomplete search that a lot of users would use as their primary way to, to direct themselves to an individual profile. So we didn't want to take that away from them. So uh, we maintained that functionality. 
Um, but we also um, created some cross-pollination in here. So um, we're able to pull out uh, specific profiles, which people are able to action directly, but they can also um, highlight individual search terms. Um, because we have such a complex and diverse hierarchy of charities in Canada, this allows people to find those cause level or population level things really quickly um, and surface keywords um, you know, right off the bat. So this is probably our primary way people can get in, um, but we're also giving people vectors for causes and um, their specific community, the community they belong to, um, you know, as part of those search vectors. Uh, so once, if a person doesn't find a specific profile they're looking for, um, we then uh, send them to a, a faceted search screen. Um, so uh, in terms of uh, some of the information, sort of the system that we established when we were looking at this, uh, each of the, uh, and on the left hand side we have our facets, very, um, you know, sort of standardized way of um, organizing facets. Uh, above the search we have uh, secondary filters which are used to kind of narrow down things once we've established our search parameters. Um, we also have the ability to change the, um, uh, the sorting and also uh, the, and the sorting itself actually there's a few different algorithms in place here based on, you know, different um, ranking scores that are going on in the background. Um, so we wanted to be able to provide two experiences for this list, um, both an experience, uh, a card-based experience where we have rich, actionable information um, on the card displayed, but then we also wanted to create a compressed view, allowing for people to look at things from more of a high level, because um, we can do things like sorting by average gift size, which you know, from an analysis standpoint is super beneficial. Um, to kind of just dig into the card detail, this is where that subject matter expertise came in really handy. So um, basically the system we created here was the left hand side of the card was uh, reserved for informational informa or information specific to the organization, its mandate um, and its location, whereas the right hand side is tangible actionable information and actions a user can take on the card. Um, so um, you'll note that we have their median gift, um, you know, whether uh, the organization is open or closed for requests. Um, and uh, information about their revenue uh, for organizations that we have that. Uh, and then the user is actually also able to um, assign a stage or a, a, in the, um, uh, the fundraising workflow uh, or pipeline right in this card. Um, so we also have that um, in the compressed view. Um, so we're just in that compressed view, we're only losing a, a few key things, um, but we still have lots of rich information and the ability to action it. Um, so yeah, so from there, uh, once a user's uh, found a funder that they're potentially interested in, um, they want to be able to d dig deep into information about that funder. Uh, so uh, keeping that card metaphor, uh, moving that forward, um, we have uh, the on the left-hand side some of the more robust information about the organization and their mandate and their programs. Um, and then from the right-hand side over, we have our actionable information. Um, users are able to add notes to the card. Um, they're able to add a request size, and again, they're able to assign a specific stage in the fundraising process to the funder, um, identifying it similar to what you do in a, a, a CRM or sales tool. Um, from there, I'm oh, sorry, just on the right-hand side, uh, mobile experience, again, sorry, it's so washed out. Um, so digging deeper into some of the um, information that we're displaying here, um, so when you're doing fundraising, uh, a big part of the process is looking at comparable organizations to see what kind of funding they've gotten in the past. So uh, if I'm working at a, a specific organization with a specific grant-seeking mandate, um, I, I need to find the right match for, in a funder. Uh, and the best way for me to do that is to look at other organizations that they've funded in the past. I can also look at the gift size so I can optimize my specific request. Um, so you can think of this as like if you were doing a sales process and you knew how much money the company that you're, you're going after spent on their previous website. Very valuable information and when you're doing gift analysis you have this. So, um, so this is CRA source data that they're uh, managing in a spreadsheet. Um, but we're also providing some uh, you know, visualizations here. Uh, I'll just clarify that not everything in here made it into the MVP. But this does represent that vision of, of being able to do this analysis. Um, so to just move on to that third screen, um, so once we've identified a funder, uh, we want to take a look at um, that funder over a long period of time. We have to prepare a solicitation, much like in the sales process, preparing your proposal. Um, so we need a pipeline. Um, so looking at tools like Pipedrive, um, or you know, obviously we're developers, so we are familiar with stuff like Jira. 
um, you know, we wanted to use the same kind of model of uh, like a drag and drop um, manageable funnel. Um, so uh, effectively users are able to move these different opportunities through the pipeline from left to right, um, from that identification process right through to that um, stewardship. And um, the, you know, the goal here to be able to provide them with the visualization of everything they have um, you know, that they're actively managing uh, from a, a um, solicitation standpoint. Um, and similarly to the search, we're providing that compressed view. Um, so this also exposes some additional functionality like being able to look at lost deals, one deals, um, archive deals, um, you know, just a, a, and again, that, that uh, you know, longer list or more in-depth uh, compressed list here as well. So, moving into the development. I think it's still you. <laughs> yeah, it is still me. Uh, so, uh, I'll be handing off to, you'll get a break from my voice <laughs> shortly. Uh, I'll hand off to Clement to, to talk about this, but I just wanted to talk a bit about um, our using Agile for this process, for this project. Um, so, in terms of, uh, you know, some of the reasons that I think Agile it was a great model for this project, and I mean, you know, often I think a lot of, um, startups who are approaching a new MVP would lean on something like Agile, lean on stuff like Lean uh, to be able to, you know, be able to accomplish the, the often constrictive goals of a, a startup. Um, so, I mean, I think Agile was really strong for us here, um, but one of the key things I think was that engagement with the product owner. So, um, our product owner actually joined our daily stand-ups, which was amazing. Um, we had, uh, you know, because of that we had um, a clarification from them on anything that needed clarification, um, and they were being someone who's actually done the job. They were able to provide that, you know, a really immediate feedback um, on a daily basis. Uh, I think also um, once the stakeholder starts to take on the agile vernacular, it, because they're there every day, that can be a really compelling thing. Um, actually, after going through this process with us, Imagine Canada started to do stand-ups internally, um, and you know, I'd like to think that was just us, but I think. Um, I think you know it's a it represents a, a broader experience that people may be having around the efficacy of those um, shorter feedback loop cycles, uh, and yeah. So uh, I think also another key point of having those product owners involved all throughout, um, being able to do really tight UAT cycles was also building those internal champions. Um, people knew how it worked right off the bat because they watched it grow, they watched it come together. So um, it helped with them onboarding other people, uh, both internally and externally. Um, I think another sort of key thing with Agile here is starting to build up that vernacular around being able to move into um, like phased future releases, uh, approaching this with this MVP uh, perspective. Um, it was very easy for us to start to take features or things that the customer wanted and say, let's move this to the backlog, let's move this to the icebox, let's, you know, let's uh, prioritize this for a future sprint um, as a way to both create you know, future opportunity to work with them to improve the product, but also to manage the scope of that MVP. And uh, so in terms of some of the product benefits, because obviously a lot of these benefits more influence <laughs> our team, um, but I think the product benefits here, um, you know, the product being simple, you know, keeping things, there were a whole bunch of other features that could have made their way into this, um, but simplifying it simplifies the onboarding process for new users. Um, it also uh, allows us to get to that point of uh, iteration in a little bit more of a managed way because um, as we start getting user feedback for the existing features, we can refine them and then we can be very careful to add additional features because you know if a product is simple, it's harder to bloat. And then, yeah, I think that's really the key thing is just making sure that you know, having that simple scope of the application allows us to much easier uh, do much easier analysis as to how users are using the product and thus make tangible improvements to it over time. So I will hand it off to Clement here to talk a bit about um, you know, how we implemented uh, some open source solutions uh, for this project. All right, so coming into this project as a, a technical architect, we got like other strategy already like smart <laughs> did. Uh, so we knew some stuff. We knew that we, it was a MVP with a short deadline, so we had to be fast. Uh, we need. We knew that there's going to be iteration on it, and improvement. So like the MVP needed to work, but we can refine it later. And we knew that there was a lot of data um, structure, um, and that's was like a big issue. And we also knew that the experience needed to be really great. So we chose for the back end Drupal uh, 
for the um, content uh, management uh, because like it allows us to like do a really great work with the um, data structure and taxonomy and everything and it also like shipped with a uh, restful web services and authentication um, and also data migration which was needed on this project um, and especially we use contenta uh, you guys know about contenta yes okay cool uh, so it's uh, api first uh, drupal distribution uh, so it comes with like endpoint uh, API endpoint directly, and all the documentation about the endpoint. So it's really useful because like you can work on the back end and give the documentation directly to your front end user, and they're gonna use that. Um, and yeah, it's also come with uh, user authentication with OAuth, which is really useful for us on this case. So that was really cool. And for the front end, we use uh, React uh, for multiple reasons, actually, because first one is like it, it, well, it's pretty easy to learn for web developer. If you know JavaScript and HTML, it comes like pretty naturally. Uh, there was a big ecosystem. There was a material UI uh, library, which was we need, did. And there's a large community, too, so we know that every like small stuff we needed already been done by someone else. And another way is like also because we can use it in parallel. So the front end can work on the React app when we are like migra migrating all the data in the back end. And so we are like two, we are completely parallel on it. So that was really cool. Okay, um, how many guys are technical here? Okay, so cool. We can go into <laughs> deeper. All right, so the big challenges on this one. Um, there was 1.5 million row of data of gifts. Uh, and those gifts are referenced to entities into the Drupal. So that was a lot of data. And it was coming from a Microsoft SQL application. And the user needed to be able to edit, add, uh, and find uh, those data easily. Uh, on the content side, like, um, yeah. And there was permission on those uh, data, on every one of each, there's permission. And we know that the client used like spreadsheets in, internally, so uh, we were like thinking about uh, doing a custom stuff with Google Sheets. So what we do is like we create on the Drupal side custom entities uh, for GIFT and, uh, and that. And we export all the data from uh, Microsoft SQL into Google, into Google Sheets. There was multiple Google Sheets. And with Migrate API, we just import from Google Sheets directly. So the client's still using spreadsheets on Google Sheets. And they are able to edit it and re-import them when they need it. And there is this directly feedback directly on Google Sheets. So here's an example. So you can see that all is green. It means that the entity reference has been resolved in Drupal. So we know that it's good. And when it's red, there's only one here. But it means that uh, Drupal didn't find the reference. So it allows the client to work directly into spreadsheet as they do in internally and still have feedback from Drupal. And in our side, we don't have to do the UI. We don't have to do the administration uh, UI for dealing with that. We just like import uh, with a Migrate API. Uh, another big topic was the search. Uh, it's in React, uh, and there's filter, there's sort, there's facets, a lot of facets. There's user customization, so a user can be can ask to not show uh, a folder, for example, if you don't want to see it anymore. So we need like to take that into consideration, and there's also permission. So. We couldn't like link directory the uh, React into the Solar. It was not possible. We have to go through Drupal. So for that, we use Solar because it's the best <laughs> uh, and Search API uh, to customize the search uh, as you will do on the basic Drupal website. And after that, you use Facet API and View REST display to deliver into JSON directly into the React component. So for example, in the Facet. Uh, there's only one component for all the facets. It just reads the facet API uh, REST uh, JSON and like build all the facets all together. So that's pretty awesome. Uh, there was other challenges. Uh, the client one was on the, on the call every day and when you're building an MVP and you have not a lot of time, 
uh, and they ask for changes or they just realize how much powerful uh, we, stuff we can do and they say, oh, that would be cool to do something like this. Uh, you have to have a project manager who say, no, the scope is that and we won't like move from that. And it can be a bit like harsh sometimes, but it's how it is. Uh, another big challenge is, is more with uh, React. Uh, you guys know Redux a bit? Yeah, all right. Uh, it's a store manager for React. And uh, we didn't like did it properly at the beginning and like we, Ending, ending, adding more and more like uh, store into the Redux, uh, and that was an issue. We had to rebuild it at one point, and still right now it's not perfect. So there's some stuff to do here. Uh, pipeline functionality. Um, so it's a drag and drop interface, and you uh, you need like instantly feedback from Drupal to say if it saved it or not. Otherwise, it's weird for the for the client to move it to another column and waiting until it's done. So that was a bit hard. And there was a Salesforce uh, service uh, authentication with OAuth uh, to manage. And the big issue with that is Salesforce is using account with multiple people on it, but you don't know which people is authenticated. So it's really hard because there's customization on it. Uh, that was really hard, but yeah. So what we learn as the technical guys, uh, first thing first, you have to design your Redux store from the beginning of the project. I guess you already know that. No, we know it. <laughs> uh, so just go with your Drupal architect uh, and your Re React developer. Just sit down and like design the Redux store from the beginning because you cannot know what's going to be. And if you do it from the beginning, you won't uh, mess with it. And one other thing is, even if you do a MVP, always think perf performance first, because like uh, it's something like as an MVP you say what I need to do is finish the product, but uh, you like screw yourself because at the end you have a product which is not really cool. And if you do it from the beginning, it's way more easier to like put it every time on every like component, and especially with server size rendering uh, on the React side. If you can do it from the beginning, it's way better. Because implementing it after, it's sometimes tricky. OK, so the benefits of the approach. Uh, so being totally decoupled uh, allows us to have like the best in class experience. Uh, so the React uh, libra library and community is moving really fast into like really cool new project and every libraries that we can use directly. And we don't have to wait until a Drupal module is there, or we don't have to implement it ourselves. We just like can use our React uh, as it is right, right now. Um, it's future proof. Like if you want to do an app, uh, we already have the backend uh, and the API and everything. And we can use some component from React to move it into React Native, for example. Uh, I don't know if we can do that, but if one day we need, uh, we can do that. And also it's really parallel so you your developer your front end developer like you give him the documentation about what content is giving you and is using only that sometimes you need a new endpoint because content can be like well just an api can be a bit verbose and you want like something faster but most of the time it says like you don't have to communicate that much as as long as you have a good documentation and a good content structure I think it's your time. <laughs> hey, thanks. Um, so um, with this project, uh, because we knew that we were going to move pretty quickly through uh, MVP, we didn't do a lot of uh, user testing on our prototype, our initial like mock-ups and UIs. We did do, obviously, we had our subject matter, uh, matter experts internally, um, but we didn't really get to do that uh, prototype testing. Um, but part of that was uh, you know, understanding that um, we're going to have that opportunity to get um, a product in front of users that they'd actually be able to interact with, uh, which I think is a lot more powerful. Um, so the reason that we want to do this and why we think it's important, um, the really I think to get to that point of continuous iteration on something, research needs to be a part of the entire process. Um, it doesn't end with um, design. It doesn't end like during development. It's research and and being you know. Um, really verbose about research is really that advantage um, to any product. 
Um, so in terms of where the project currently is, so we actually just finished uh, an additional um, two sprints with them leading into um, their beta release. It's currently in an alpha release, so they do have some users um, you know, testing it and dealing with things as we break them occasionally. Um, but um, what's really great is how we've already started to be able to get feedback from users about what features they really feel is, are missing or what refinements might be uh, useful moving into the f into the future. Um, so another big thing that we wanted to do that we prioritized um, towards the end was um, ensuring that we had uh, a um, a way to actually start to pull in uh, metrics from the application that were useful to user experience. So often, what happens when you build a website, um, you turn on Google Analytics and then you go away, and that's it. Um, and, and then even the people who work as marketing managers or product managers, whoever they are, never really look at the metrics through that eye of UX. Um, so this was my request that I put on the team, uh, but I think it'll be really useful in the long term. Um, so we implemented this React uh, Google Analytics library, which allows us to trigger custom events from basically any imaginable user interaction, uh, which allows for really cool data to come through. Um, so um, pardon the verbosity of this, but we basically have um, every single time a user is actioning an individual profile, so they're moving it through different phases, we get data on it, um, and a specific kind of declarative data. So we have, I mean, it's a code here, but we know, uh, and this is for the user, I should say, but we know exactly what uh, profile or whatever funder they've identified, and we know exactly what they've done. Um, so we're really tracking how they're using that pipeline on a granular level, um, and the goal will be for us to be able to, like, over time to actually develop some aggregate data around this. Um, there's a bunch of other data points we're looking at, but really our goal is to get to that point where we're able to look at um, the user's flow through the application um, in a really, really granular way, uh, pull out trends, and do all kinds of rich uh, analysis um, on how people are using things. So, um, you know, I think... I'm, I'm of the mindset that like, you know, quantitative research is like the most important thing that you can do, but often we get stuck doing a lot of qualitative research because we have bad data, not because it's better. Um, now, I think it's really important to obviously get in front of people and, and test them and get their reactions, but that's like this emotional journey thing, which um, is very easy to uh, obfuscate, and it's also very easy to get wrong because your data pool is going to be tiny. You ask 20 users or 40 users, and then you test. Um, this will allow me to get 100% visibility on every single user that uses the application, look at behaviors at this high level, um, and really dig deep into how people are going to use things. Um, and I think from our standpoint, in terms of how we're working with Grant Connect um, and, and the team, to really be able to provide them with guidance and feedback and recommendations, and to be frank, from a business standpoint, identify new opportunities for us to make money by showing them exactly what's going wrong, um, what's going right, uh, and how we can improve things. So uh, this kind of leads into our next thing. So um, you know, as mentioned before, um, we have our Therefore Care program, which um, you know, in the long term, um, we're just sort of pivoting towards this right now. Um, but the goal is really to work with the organization on those larger strategic goals. Um, so working with Imagine Canada, this was actually one project with them. Uh, we actually started working with them with, in 2017 on a broader organizational strategy. Uh, so this project uh, basically factored in as the first step in that roadmap with them. Um, so uh, in terms of what's next with them, um, you know, obviously the product itself isn't where that customer journey begins. So uh, we're actually in the midst of um, a project right now to redesign their marketing properties for this project, for this product, and two other um, products that they offer. They're technically programs, but it's all products to me. Uh, and then, um, so we're going to be helping them deploy a marketing platform for this, also um, uh, some uh, customer journey orchestration around how users um, interact with different platforms. Um, and in general, right, we, because we're, um, we're, this kind of interaction that we're having with Imagine Canada, we're looking at different properties and looking to grow uh, something like Grant Connect um, in terms of its uh, user base. And so by looking at their marketing strategy, looking at all these things together um, and having access to that, um, it's really powerful because it allows us to provide them with recommendations um, from that uh, holistic level. Um, and it's, I mean, we're kind of blessed to have that opportunity. 
Um, so in terms of our you know, ongoing uh, purview, obviously what we want to continue to do is um, research and improve Grant Connect, which means we have to figure out ways to make more money for Imagine Canada so that they can pay us more to keep to improve the product. Um, so yeah, so we really think that that's a valuable way to work. Obviously, we don't get that opportunity all the time, um, but yeah, I mean, whenever possible, I think uh, being able to have that deeper level of, of research and engagement with customers um, can um, put together some pretty fruitful stuff. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, so uh, you know, for anyone in the, in the room that's not a developer or working for an agency, um, you know, uh, certainly reach out to us if you have a unique challenge similar to this one. Um, but obviously, if you're a developer, um, you know, we, and you think that this kind of work might be exciting to you, um, definitely reach out to us. Um, this is our marketing campaign email. Uh, don't take it personally, but we're just trying to uh, work on our own lead generation. So if you want to reach out to us, please reach out to us at this email, and um, we'll definitely make sure that the right person uh, gets back to you. Um, I don't know if you've been by our booth, but we are giving away these creepy Amazon Echoes that watch everything you do. Um, it seems to be a concern amongst a lot of people, so I apologize. Next time we'll try to give away something more innocuous. Um, but yeah, so feel free to come by the booth uh, for that or just to chat. Um, we intentionally didn't include a demo of the actual product um, because live demos are terrifying, but also uh, because um, we wanted you to come by our booth. So if you're at uh, the camp tomorrow, uh, definitely come by and we'll give you a, a video preview of the app so you can see um, what all of these features got drilled down to when we actually talk about an MVP. And um, you know, finally, uh, we actually have a copy of this uh, case study up on Drupal.org. Um, slightly different version um, if you're interested in reading. And um, the, uh, yeah, so if you're interested in reading that, go ahead and um, visit that slightly long link to, from Bitly. And that's pretty much it. So thank you. Um, so I guess uh, just address any questions, if anyone has any. It's the end of day. End of day. So everybody, does everybody have their gift cards to the rec room? Everybody like cashed in on those, no? Not everyone? Okay. Well, if you uh, need gift cards to go to the rec room, the after party, uh, we have some. Pantheon has some. We'll be happy to uh, you know, get you guys $20 so you can go enjoy uh, VR experiences, etc. So thanks. <laughs>